Welcome to the Special Cube program. We're going to help you better understand how to manage risk by securing your digital supply chain. And we're going to first give you a high level preview of what's happening in the market. And with me is Ben Fisher, who's emerging security technology advocate at Red Hat. Yeah, so let's set it up. What can people expect to hear from this program? So today um, I'm going to start off and you're going to, uh, we're going to have a conversation about some of the business challenges uh, related to the software supply chain. And then the next uh, video will be with uh, Vincent Dana, uh, Red Hat's VP of product security and Luke Hines, our security lead from the office of the CTO. And uh, they're going to discuss more of the security aspects of the software supply chain. Uh, thirdly, you'll, here's a newcomer, uh, Director of Hybrid Platform Security Product Management. Uh, we'll, we'll dig into some of the, the practices and the technologies, and that will be followed up by Andrea Hall uh, and Andrew Block. Uh, Andrea is a specialist solution architect, and Andrew is a distinguished architect. Uh, and they're going to cover some of the changing environments. There's a lot of changing environments related to the regulations and, and, and different movements in, in the industry uh, and organizations. And then lastly, we have a, we'll have a video from an um, interview you did with uh, Luke Hines uh, discussing a uh, software signing tool uh, called Sigstor and how it can improve security supply chains. Excellent, thank you for that. Okay, so Ben, people hear the term software supply chain and they may think, oh, that's an interesting name. But what do we mean by the term software supply chain, Ben? So it's a loaded term. Um, Simply, it, it's just, it's the supply chain, but of software. And you kind of, people get think, oh, well, I just go to a store and I buy software and it comes you know, packaged maybe in the old days. Um, but these days uh, there's something called open source software. So there's, there's repositories and collaboration upstream where a lot of communities, people in a community uh, contribute to all these different pieces of the software. Um, it's kind of like when you go to a store, you go to a store, and you just you just see this one piece, um, but that store carries lots of different products, and for each of those products, they have relationships with uh, different vendors and different distributors to get gather all those products into a store, and, and that, it's pretty complex. So there's been this kind of curation of of products and softwares um, that's kind of come about, uh, kind of like a warehouse club. So. Uh, like you would trust a warehouse club to be kind of a, a place to reduce the amount of shopping you might have, or you can kind of go there and you trust that they have good products that you you like and they that fulfill most of your needs for your family. Uh, and you can go there and you can kind of get most of your shopping in one place versus having to drive all around town to go get a bunch of different products that are carried in different stores and then having to research all those products. Um, warehouse clubs or um, make, make that experience very simple. And so there's been kind of an upsurge of, of um, organizations like Red Hat that just uh, help simplify uh, your choices and do that curation. And the value there is in trying to not just give you everything, but also curate and try to make sure that what you have is, is secure, make sure what you have is up to date, uh, kind of do all these kind of nuanced things. So it, this, the software supply chain is kind of complex in that there's all these extra details that you need to be kind of aware of. And it's true, you know, you could run around town and shop for every product you would like yourself. Um, just like in a software supply chain, you could go directly and get all the pieces of software and manage them and update them and do all the work yourself. Uh, but it, it's a lot of work. And it is, as the word implies, it's a chain. So it's not just one relationship, it's a whole chain of relationships and um, having a trusted entity uh, as kind of a proxy to, to, that you could put your faith in and knowing that they're kind of doing some of that work for you makes life a lot easier. Just like in the warehouse club, right? You, you want to kind of go one place, get all your shopping done and, and be satisfied. Um, and so just like you would um, in traditional times, a lot of, you know, before open source came out, there was a lot of proprietary software and you'd put your trust and faith into them that they would, civil, they would, they would satisfy all of your needs and, um, and they could, they would do service you entirely. Um, but even proprietary software now is using open source software. So it comes into the same problem. So you need to have a trusted, uh, partner basically for, for uh, 
to help you understand and give you that level of trust in the software you're buying. Makes sense. Yeah, and Red Hat plays that critical role. Uh, so let's explain why all of a sudden this topic of, of digital supply chain, software supply chain has taken center stage. What, ben, what should people understand about the digital supply chain and how it impacts uh, their, their respective businesses? Well, the digital supply chain is, is just really, really critical. I mean, if, if nothing else, I mean, uh, to bring up the kind of the COVID analogy, right? Um, everything changed with COVID and things just got accelerated because we realized that the, the old way of doing things in person in a lot of physical ways uh, slowed things down. And so uh, when we were trying to social distance and have uh, space, uh, the pressure for doing everything in, in a digital form and to make it easier to, you know, order your groceries and have them delivered to your door or, you know, do a, a trunk, you know, delivering of your pizza uh, at the local, local pizza shop all this became really critical. Um, so, <laughs> uh, yeah, it just, it just, honestly, the, the COVID experience really accelerated the whole, the whole need for, for digital transformation. I'm not trying to necessarily go there, uh, but that was part of the supply chain because all those companies also needed to have that digital experience with all of their vendors. And it's, it's kind of accelerated in that respect. Um, so, the supply chain in, in general is something that's gotten a lot of attention. Uh, I think people actually understand, maybe have an idea what the word means um, in the last over the last two years uh, with all the incidents that have happened and kind of the, the power of, of having it as a, in, in digital electronic form um, really, really, I think has hit home for a lot of people. Uh, and it, it's critical because now I just don't feel like the world can ever really kind of go back from that. We're all so dependent upon transacting in a digital form. Our businesses rely on, we rely on a daily checking their phones, checking websites for information, doing everything. All of this is run on software, right? And it's not just software that maybe one person wrote and can maintain for the rest of their lives and do it in a perfect form. At some point, the software, you know, almost all of it ha is using different parts of software that are open source and out there and available. And people took the pieces that were already developed because there's no reason to recreate the wheel. And they just kind of pulled in all these little open source components. And then they, they, if they did any programming, it was the programming around that to kind of make that, make that usable for their particular use case. And everyone's just gotten very, very comfortable with this model of pulling software uh, what we would say from the upstream down to the downstream in, and consume it and, and utilize it themselves. It's just pervasive everywhere. We, it's just, uh, you know, open source, they say it's kind of eaten the world and that's um, kind of where it's come from. Right. Yeah, and, and this is really a major issue for folks. We're seeing all kinds of new techniques. And, and I mean, for example, just imagine you've got dozens or even hundreds of suppliers and, and the bad guys are targeting, you know, a victim. And they, they might put a piece of malware in an individual, one of the suppliers, you, you know, they'll get in to one of the suppliers and that's a benign piece of code, but when it gets actually through the victim's, you know, the target's firewall, things will start to self-form in, in ways that we've really not seen before. And so this is really a big issue. There's a lot of talk coming from, from policymakers. Of course, the POTUS has issued an executive order and is putting pressure on, on businesses and technology companies to improve their security posture. I wish it were as easy as a sort of a swipe of a pen, but what's behind these trends, Ben? So oh, there's, there's so much behind there. Um, so I think you were, you were alluding to something really, really, um, really important. So in the security world, I mean, most of, of the issues in the security world is due to, you know, breaches, I should say, hacks, are due to kind of unpatched uh, vulnerabilities. So the problem with that is then the answer is, well, you should patch and patch regularly. And that's absolutely true. Uh, you should patch as much as you can where it's not causing business disruptions. But what you, when you get into a supply chain or digital supply chain issue, uh, if you have a hacker who is able to, to penetrate um, into, into a vendor's uh, software and they are able to place something that gets placed into their update mechanism and then gets pushed out to all of our customers, it, it's, it can be catastrophic and it can be 
uh, it can it, it will spread very fast. And all the customers that are doing the right thing normally by by doing constant updates uh, will get infected. And this is this is kind of the scary thing. Obviously, it is the right thing to do, um, and the right thing is for those vendors to to secure their environments as much as possible and and do everything they can to make that as as tight as possible. Uh, but also, as in anything, it's really some, we we are in a world now where it's not if you're going to be breached or you know it's going to be when. Like everybody in the world, especially in the United States, we've all we've all had our yeah, had breaches with our confidential information um, exposed, right? It's it's kind of the world we live in. It's it's what we expect. So, with that understanding, you know, it's not. It, it becomes more about how we react to that. It's you know, if your credit card number gets exposed, it's not you just don't throw your hands up in the air. You go, okay, well, I need to put a credit freeze. I need to do certain you know diligent actions. Actions. Same thing in the industry. You know, if something happens like that, an organization needs to respond. Uh, properly and and fast to to kind of you know under to to share with the industry what has happened to stop those updates from continuing to perpetrate and provide guidance on, on what they can do and this is one of the wonderful things I think about the security industry is is actually the willingness and interest to share uh, you'd kind of think of people in the old days wanting to hide their security secrets hide and protect how they what they do to make sure that um, uh, to safeguard all their assets, to safeguard the company, their data, everything. And I'm not saying that everything is exposed, but there's a moral willingness to share information on on threats they're seeing and collaborate on on fixes and work through uh, very difficult issues in a collaborative way, which is uh, I think it's really wonderful and it, it plays perfectly in my mind to kind of the open source uh, mentality. Of of doing things together out in the open across organizations, right? So I mean, it's, again, it's you know the very things that the good behavior we're supposed to be doing with patching and what everybody's advising us to do. You have to be really careful that can actually turn around and bite you. So how should we think about trust with software? What does that even mean today, Ben? It's I, well, it is. It's becoming more important than than ever before because before. Um, you know, they're like I, I. I'll tell you way back when I was a long time ago when I was uh, quite young. Uh, you would just download software and you would share it with friends and copy it, and there was no such thing as antivirus, and everybody was fine with that, and you didn't even think of an issue. Um, and then I remember the first uh, antivirus or viruses came out, and then you went down to your local computer software store, and they were handing out free discs with antivirus fixes for that one particular issue. So. You went down and you got it and, and you'd patch it up and and that was that. And you didn't really have any worries beyond that. Um, these days, you know, and that's because you trusted the store and you 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 knew there was only one issue and nobody really nobody was it was kind of a free environment where nobody thought that anything bad would really happen. Um, today, though, we hear in the news constantly about cyber attacks, about breaches, about um, just endless numbers of things that are happening, ransomware. There's so many different types of attacks and it's happening in so many different ways across every industry, every geography. Every geography. It, it's everywhere. Um, you know, it's it's really, in my mind, kind of the, the world's largest industry, cybercrime. And and that that's just a scary thing. And that that's because it's profitable. And so, you know, when you think of it as that, as a kind of a, a, an evil industry, if you will, um, it puts things into a little bit of perspective that, okay, their motives for the most part are around money and they're trying to do this. So if that's the case, then you're just trying to create enough friction that it's just not profitable for them. And so it's not, it's not about doing everything in terms of security. It's about trying to do enough of the right things to mitigate the risk for the organization. And so getting back to your point about trust, how do you trust the software that you're given? You know, if if you download a piece of software, you should be thinking about where did I where's the software being downloaded from? There's lots of sites, there's lots and lots of ways to get it. There's absolutely millions of different pieces of just open source code that's out there. And you just because you download it from a site, you don't know who posted it, you don't know a lot of this these issues. So it can be scary. And as an organization, you can choose to take on all or, or part of that risk by trying to understand which which locations are safe. Uh, you can try to understand um, 
you know, which code is safe and you know, which code, you know, you can basically feel comfortable that there's a level of trust um, or simply you can shift that risk over to an organization that might do some of that work for you, like kind of in any business model. Uh, Red Hat is an entity and it, it focuses on open source software. So, you know, you can go out and you could download any bit of open source software that Red Hat sells and you can, you can run it today. There's, there's nothing stopping you and that's wonderful and we're happy that you're doing that. But Red Hat plays a particular role in that we're trying to kind of curate that software. We're trying to, we're not we're trying to pick the best piece of software that we, we feel we can trust. We have a lot of people in those communities working with the people who actually work on that software. Uh, we believe in the open source model, partly because not only is it collaborative and just open and transparent, uh, but in that transparency and in that collaboration, there is a review of all the code that gets submitted. So if you can go to upstream, upstream the right upstream article um, repositories, and you can work with those people, you have insight into what, what's happening, and you can you can pull down the pieces and the components that you feel are best that you can package into a product that you feel can provide uh, all meet all the needs for your particular customers. And you can do that in a, in a particular way. And then having that, that close proximity to those communities, uh, you also have an idea when there's updates and patches and you get to work on those. And that allows you to bring, uh, consume those faster and, and bring those to your customers uh, faster. And so this is, this is part of the trust element is, is having, it's a matter of, do you want to do it yourself? Like, like, you know, warehouse club analogy, you know, do you want, do you want to go to hundred stores when you do a, a shopping list or, you know, 20, 30 stores driving around a whole day is, I don't know. I don't want to do that on my Saturday. Uh, or, you know, do you want to go to a warehouse club? Yeah. You might, you might pay a little bit more. There's a premium there. Uh, you have to have that warehouse club membership and, but, then you kind of go to one store and maybe get 80% of your shopping done there. And that's really good. And maybe you get the 20% from a couple other stores down the street, but you're, you're done in a matter of a few hours versus the whole day. Mm -hmm. And so I would implore you in terms of trust, you need to think about what are the critical pieces of software that you have in your organization, right? What are the, the critical digital uh, processes that your organization runs? Think about them. And also not just think about what the risks are around them, but also think about beyond them, what the risks are to the people you're trusting. So whether it's, whether it's Red Hat or whether it's a particular website, you might be wanting to download that open source software fund from, you need to think about, you know, it's, it's a whole chain of things. So you will need to know that, okay, I have access to these, these things. I have this information um, and I have these risks. Now, if I extend that out one, one degree further, then what risks are those folks associated, uh, are, are exposed to, you know, what do they have knowledge of? And, and do that and then think about it and, and think about it and evaluate and who has the most information, who has the most, you know, where are the risks and think about what makes sense for organization in terms of um, mitigating those risks and giving you the, the best ability to, to respond when something does happen. I think you can reduce your risk exposure uh, with with uh, some an organization that curates open source or even closed source, um, but also you can also kind of reduce the blast radius. I think because if they can get you those updates faster, uh, respond faster than you could yourself, uh, then that that's hugely valuable too. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, to your point about it, it's very lucrative for the hackers. I mean, the the, the criminal algorithm is actually pretty simple. It, it's all about ROI for them, which is. How much value can they extract, and what does it cost them you know, to extract that? You know, numerator, denominator, and so to the extent that you can increase the cost to the hacker, there's less value to them, and they will go look somewhere else. So the question is, what are the parameters of trust in software that can potentially help organizations increase that that uh, that denominator? Uh, and and you know, how do you define trustworthy software? What, what are the attributes? Yeah, so, so there's a lot of attributes. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I come back to the kind of warehouse club analogy. It, it's, you know, when you kind of go to the warehouse club, they've kind of already pre-picked for various use cases, kind of, you know, here, here's the, you know, here's the two brands of shavers and we have it in, you know, 
uh, the disposal form and the you know replacement blade form, and, and you just have the, the, the few options there. And it's, it's you have a nice simple selection, and you look at it, and you know you can see the price, and you kind of you know you know the quantity, and you have have certain information. And if you did want to look up more information, it's either on the package or you pull your phone to get more information. Um, in, in the open source world, you know some things you want to look at. You want to see its transparency. So everything in in open source is very transparent. Uh, if you do want to go with a closed source provider, that's that's fine too. But you know you do want to have as much transparency as possible. So you want to build up a good relationship, um, whether it's Red Hat, open source, or a closed source vendor. You want to have that relationship to get insight. And if it's closed source, it's it's more important because you need to get go deeper into that relationship to, to understand what's happened behind that veiled curtain. Um, accountability. So, you know, whether it is software that you're getting through another organization, um, you want to make sure you know who in that organization is accountable. Uh, you want to know how they're going to be accountable, how they're going to respond. Uh, if it's upstream, uh, right now, one thing that's coming through is something called SBOM software bills and material, which has details about kind of an ingredient list, if you will of that software. And that is something that will in the future make it a little bit easier for everybody. But also if you're gonna, you know, get software yourself directly, uh, give you an understanding of maybe who's accountable, who actually wrote the software or made the patch or, or submitted the last update uh, to a branch. That type of information um, is very useful because you kind of need, you, at some point you may need to know who did this to verify if something is trustworthy, if something was intentional or not, if you see something that, that might be uh, um, curious or I don't know, questionable in some nature. Um, and traceability, you wanna be able to have that ability to understand all the changes that have been done in that software, right? Software is, um, you know, it, it's highly versioned. So there's constantly new features or updates or patches, and you wanna be able to go through and know what's, what's happened there. Um, so you, not only for the, the benefit of understanding the things that have been added, the, the benefits that have been added to that software, but if something happened or you were trying to make sure nothing bad happened, you'd want to make sure maybe there has been no uh, malicious submissions into that code stream as well. Um, and so by tracing that, that's good. And then the whole auditability of being able to go back and look at the software and having somebody um, understand what might have happened by kind of digging into uh, all the records for that particular software. I'd also say risk management because you, as an organization, you really need to know what your risks are and you need to be able to, to not just do that at the macro level, but now with the software supply chain, you need to bring that down uh, to kind of the software level and really understand, you know, if I'm, if I, my business reply, if my business relies on upon a particular uh, software component like OpenSSL, uh, for VPN software and you know site-to-site -site networking and whatnot, I need to make sure that that if anything happens to this this piece of software, which is a, a critical component for me operating my business, what am I going to do about it? You know, do I just terminate all my VPN connections and leave my remote workers stranded and you know disable site-to-site -site networking so my my different sites don't have direct networking connections? But you have to kind of think about um, what are the risks and you know, what are my, what's my plan B? How would I, how would I possibly manage things? Mm -hmm. And it, it feels very overwhelming when you think about the number of components. And so this is where understanding this and trying to find ways to mitigate risk and manage it, make things a little bit simpler so you can really focus on things that matter, I think are important. And then incident response, which is, there's going to be something that happens sometime to some piece of software that you, your organization has. So, you know, how are you going to respond? How are you going to even find out? How are you going to know that something happens? How are you monitoring, you know, um, for vulnerabilities in, in the software? How are you connecting with the upstream communities and being aware that, that something is, is um, something kind of is happening wrong and there's a bunch of developers scrambling to try to, to fix something quick because maybe there's a known exploit of some software out in the wild. Mm -hmm. So uh, having that awareness and having that, that um, ability, to, ability to respond uh, really is, is probably one of the most critical things here. Ben, can you give us a sense of this kind of the scope of this problem? Are there metrics you, you can share to, to kind of frame the issue for the audience? Um, I mean, yeah, there. Yeah, so in terms of um, 
open source supply chain attacks. Um, some type uh, software uh, vendor actually has reports uh, every year and they've reported that there was a 650% increase in open source supply chain attacks in the past year. And this is on top of a 430% increase the prior year. So it is, it's scary, but it's, it's basically literally exploding in terms of, of the threats happening in the supply chain attacks. And these, these are, supply chain attacks are not new, um, but they're, they've become quite popular and uh, the power of the supply chain, how it's as an amplifying factor is starting to get exploited really well by the attackers these days. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's kind of go to best practice. I mean, what are businesses doing about these today, these problems today? What should they be doing that, that maybe they're not doing? So with the explosion, you can understand that there's, with the spike of these supply chain attacks, organizations are honestly and understandably uh, pretty caught off guard. So while organizations have been working on their cybersecurity programs for some time now, um, they're mostly trying to react. And by react, they're reacting with maybe not, not the most efficient of uh, incident response plans yet. Um, and these attacks kind of are spreading like wildfire. Um, but as an industry, you know, it's not really helping us get ahead. So, you know, it, it's kind of the unfortunate place where we're at. Um, you, you mentioned that, you know, there's obviously there's some um, guidance from POTUS and, and uh, other folks in the industry and, and various efforts in the industry to work on improving the supply chain, work on improving different components that can help um, make things dramatically better for the industry. Um, but they're still kind of, early, they're still pretty early stage. There's still a lot of work to be done. So as far as kind of what we can be doing as an industry, um, obviously, you know, I, I'll say collaboration again, because, you know, by working together, uh, whether it's with the government or in an upstream, you know, organization setting standards, uh, these things are all really important. And especially within verticals, I think it's really important to kind of get together because even if you have a general standard, uh, things can vary quite a bit within the verticals. Um, but besides that outwardly looking action, looking inside and trying to understand uh, really, it, it, in a sense, it's a kind of a simple thing. It's a, a business process engineering question of, okay, what are your critical business processes? You know, what do those business processes rely upon? You know, what software components are there? And then, okay, for those, those pieces of software, you know, what are, you know, they also have different components. Uh, so even if you go to, you know, whether you go to a, you know, an open source provider or a closed source provider, there are open source components. So understanding those, the software that you, that you use, understanding where you get those, the, that software from, and understanding the components in the software and how those are digested, whether it's from you know, an organization like Red Hat, that's open source, uh, or maybe a closed source provider is really important. Developing the relationships so you have that, that bi-directional trust with those organizations that are running that critical software uh, for your organization is, is really important. Um, so it's a lot more of a kind of a mapping and awareness type exercise mm -hmm. uh, because from there you can start asking a bunch of different questions and by having in, engaging in conversations about those questions, you're going to learn more and more and more, and that will continue to lead, lead forward. Um, eventually, you know, you'll, you'll get an understanding of, I have these risks and you may not necessarily know everything, but along the way, you'll start developing awareness of risks. And then you can ask yourself along the way, okay, as an organization, let's come together and figure out how can we, um, how can we, let's look at these risks and how can we think, you know, think about mitigating these, right? Within our budget, within, you know, for, uh, to meet our business needs, et cetera. Um, and, but it, it's, a, it's a hard question because there, there's so many, so much software out there. Our businesses are so critical on so many ways There's so much software and each software has so many different components it, it's a pretty overbearing problem. So it's, you know, I just, uh, it, not trying to scare anybody, but it's just important to just take some time and think about it and understand what you have and, and be diligent about kind of walking through those, uh, those business processes, you know, and, and start with the most critical ones and kind of keep walking forward. And as you're mitigating them, think about, do you want to have an organization help you with these or do you want to hire people 
and have them invest their time into doing the work that an, organiza an outside organization might do for you. Right. Hey, Ben, I've, I've taken a lot of your time. Really appreciate your, your insights and really great to have you on. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me, David. Appreciate it. And thank you for watching theCUBE. This is Dave Vellante. We are the leader in enterprise technology coverage.